the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. We are the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen. So... Welcome. We're on the Parax Network every week, and we channel individuals that are on the other side. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, and I would like to thank you for tuning in to our show tonight. This week, we will be interviewing the industrialist and philanthropist Milton Hershey. He was an amazing person. You're about to find out he was much more than just a producer of candy bars. Yes, and... Tonight, I've been really looking forward to it because <clears throat> this is a very, very special interview for me. I was born and grew up several miles from the town of Hershey and was able to experience many of the benefits of, mis of Mr. Hershey's accomplishments. Making up the questions and viewing the early photographs of the town were quite a trip down memory lane for me. Both of our daughters were born in the Hershey Hospital, which was the same building in which Mr. Hershey passed. My mother even worked for him in the chocolate factory for a period of time. So we're about to speak in the spirit of, of an incredible individual. Our chat room here at Para-X is open, and we welcome any questions. We, of course, do have a list of prepared questions, but I always like to try to get in questions from the chat room, too, because we get some pretty darn good ones. All right, and I always try to give a disclaimer. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the actual channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Paranet X Network, or of our sponsors. Last week, we had a very interesting show in which we interviewed the spirits of St. Peter and Judas Iscariot. We learned the actual truth about the actions of Judas. If you missed the show, it is available on our YouTube channel, and I would suggest that you go check it out. It was quite surprising news for everybody. Please tell your friends about us so we can continue to grow our listeners. All of our previous shows are available on our YouTube channel that is in the name of Barry Strom and Potomatic.com under the name of Channeling History, where you can download them or just listen for free. It's also available on Audible, iTunes, Spotify, and most of the other popular platforms. When we begin our channeling tonight, I will ask the questions, and Barry will answer the questions in the words of Mr. Hershey. Okay, now if you've listened to our show, you also know we always have Connie say a prayer of protection. There's evil out there, and we are working back and forth with the other side, and we don't want to take any chances. So, Connie, let's say the prayer, and let's get on with the interview, because I'm really looking forward to it. I am as well. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Welcome, Mr. Hershey. We are so happy to have you here this evening. Would you like to begin with a message? Yes, I would. I was, I'm very happy to be here. I, it's very difficult for us to talk with people on the other side, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. I was a very simple country boy. Grew up in the farmlands of central Pennsylvania. Didn't get much education. Worked on the family farms. It was a tough place to live. But... I always felt that I wanted to try to do something to help other people. I was very lucky. God blessed me to be able to follow my life plan. He made me extremely wealthy, and he gave me the opportunity to do what I wanted to do to help others. I would hope that there would be individuals out there that follow my example. I did my best. I tried, I actually 
think that I succeeded pretty well. The town of Hershey is an amazing place. When I go back and visit it, I can hardly believe that my my dream that started in an empty field actually is now a place where millions and millions of people each year go to visit. I never expected such a success. But along with all that success, I've helped many, many people. It's the Christmas season, and I would hope that many people out there would do what they can to help others as well. So I know you have a bunch of questions for me, Connie, so why don't we just get started? Okay, so you were born in 1857 in Derry Township, which is in central Pennsylvania. Could you give us a little more description of what that area was like when you were growing up? It was very, very rural. It was, it was a time where farming was the main industry. It was a time where our country was being torn apart by a civil war. The Pennsylvania Dutch were very prolific in that area. They were good people, hardworking people. My parents actually spoke Pennsylvania Dutch as, as I did as well. But it was just strictly farmland. The closest town was Lancaster. York was a, a very small area. So it was... Uh, it was, it was just very, very rural. There was very little opportunity to go to school. There were a couple very small facilities, one-room schools around. But it was a place where people just simply worked. Would you tell us about your parents? <clears throat> My mother was a wonderful person. She bore most of the burden of raising me. She tried to guide me as best she could. My father was kind of loose. He was always a dreamer, never really accomplished much. He moved us around, thinking that we would have better opportunities in different areas. She finally divorced him. My mother, my mother was truly a wonderful individual. Okay, could you tell us a little more about your education? You said there was just one room school there? Well, as we moved around, there were some opportunities for, for some basic edu education. But every time we moved, things would change. I would have to be working on the, on the lands. If you didn't work on your own farm in those days, you didn't eat, so... As it turned out, I wound up with probably having the equivalent of a fourth or fifth grade education by the time I had to, had to worry strictly about getting a job. That is amazing. What was your religious background? <clears throat> My parents were Mennonite. That's uh, a, a very basic religion, similar to the Amish in many ways in the Pennsylvania Dutch. <clears throat> Not as strict, but a very a religion that enforced the rules of the Gospels and the Bible. My mother never left any doubt that God truly existed. And I always knew that I could count on him. I always believed in him. I tried to promote religions throughout my life. I was I was a very hardworking person. I prayed. I listened to the messages that I would receive from our Lord. I I think that I reflected the hardworking background of the people of central Pennsylvania and my religious beliefs. How did you like working in a newspaper shop? I didn't. I thought that the business was very, very boring. My mother arranged for me to get a job. I was only like 14 or 15 years old. The individual that I was working for was not the kindest. 
He was very difficult to work for. <clears throat> I had an accident one day, and he actually and he fired me for it. I made up my mind that that that, that working in newspapers was certainly not something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. <clears throat> So how did you become interested in making candy? Which, by the way, I'm really glad you did. It was my mother's idea. <clears throat> she always could make some interesting snacks for us. We never had much. But she tried to, to make some basic candies and some sweets. She thought that it would be an interesting occupation for me. And I agreed with her. I thought, I thought that it would be something that I would love to try. There really weren't any manufactured candies in those days. So everything was very different. She arranged for me to work for a uh, master candy maker. He taught me a lot about the confectionery business. He instilled a very good work ethic for me, and he gave me some basic recipes. So the more I was in the, that I worked for him, as an apprentice, the more I realized that it was something that I wanted to try to make a living at. Yeah. What was your first business adventure? <clears throat> I tried to go out on my own in Philadelphia. I knew that that was, a, that was the largest city at that time in Pennsylvania. We were coming up on an anniversary of the founding of America. And I thought that it would be a good time to start a candy business there. I also realized after we got started that some of my business knowledge was what, what, it, what it should be. And, and the business, I worked very hard at it for several years, but I couldn't make a go of it. How many times did you have failed business ventures? I actually had a fairly difficult time early in my life trying different business ventures. I tried to open a store in New York City. I worked at that for years. That didn't work out. I tried to do many other things. Uh, actually went to Denver, worked for some people out there, learned some new recipes. It was, it was, it was a very rough time. I was actually fairly aged until I started to make a success of things. I was in my 40s. Were these failures in a part of your life plan? Yes. You have to learn failure before you learn success. If you never fail at anything, you don't understand what it is to not be able to fulfill your dreams. Failure is very difficult. It's generally much easier to fail at something than it is to succeed. But you have to learn how to conquer your failures. You have to learn how to conquer a fear of failure. Many people try something, fail at it, and decide that they're just simply not going to try again. I made up my mind that I, was, I wanted to succeed at selling candy. While that might not be the most earth-shaking business in the world, it gave, when I did learn how to succeed at it, it gave me the opportunity to help so many other people. I think that God led me through those failures. Even though I was failing, I was learning. I would get different recipes uh, when I was in Denver, I learned how to make a special caramel out of fresh milk. You see, this was pioneer times. There weren't many people out there. The candy shops were all small. Uh, chocolate was a thing of luxury for the Europeans. People really hadn't figured out how to make chocolate out of using quality milk. The more that I traveled the country, the more that God had me learn, and he gave me the tools to succeed. In 1883, you started the Lancaster Caramel Company in Lancaster, as you said. Could you tell us more about that business? 
<clears throat> that was my first breakthrough. I learned how to make a very delicious caramel. The people loved it. I, I used to actually sell it from hand carts. So it was like my life was, was, was not always one of luxury. But people liked it. I ran into individuals from Europe that made large orders, taught me how to export, how to make large volumes. I actually had a very large business. I had over a thousand people working for me. I had two large buildings. We made an awful lot of caramel. And when I finally sold the business, it gave me the funding I needed to start the chocolate factory. Yeah, what made you decide to go change from caramel to chocolate? I felt the chocolate would be a much wider market. People really did not understand it. It was a luxury item. It was very expensive. And I thought it was absolutely delicious. I... It also, there was a fairly large supply of cocoa beans that I could use to make it. The process, I went to an exposition and I saw chocolate making equipment from Europe they brought over that was on display. I purchased the chocolate making equipment at, <clears throat> at the exposition. I started setting up an experimental building where we would play with different recipes, with different formulas for making it. Good milk was the key to it. It was actually what became known as milk chocolate. But that is what made it, the addition of the milk, which was relatively low priced, is what brought the cost down that we could afford to do mass production with it. So as I said, the entire thing was a blessing of God. He gave me the education to do it, gave me the opportunity, and I was lucky enough to make everything work and put it together. Okay. Why did you choose Dairy Township in Pennsylvania to create your chocolate factory? The land was very cheap there. There was little or no industry. But most importantly, it was this beautiful farmland country. The farmers were specializing in dairy cows. There was a lot of milk available. You see, if I did not have a good supply of quality milk, there was no way that I could mass produce what I wanted to do. So I knew that if I worked with the, the farmers, that I could have a, a steady supply of the main raw material that I needed to make a quality product. What made your milk chocolate so popular? Tasted good. <laughs> and I could make it relatively cheap. Keep in mind that it was a unique product at the time. Individuals had made things out of sugar. They had hard candies. But they never really had the opportunity to have an inexpensive product made out of chocolate. It's hard for you to understand today as you, as you walk around in the supermarket, you've got chocolate on everything. I mean, you have raisins covered with chocolate. You have a hundred different types of candy bars with chocolate. But in my time, there was no such thing. So the people were really eager for something that they could afford, for something that tasted good, and it just, it was the ideal time to begin, the, the, to enter the candy market. Yeah. In 1898, you married Catherine. Please tell us about her. <clears throat> Catherine was a wonderful woman. I actually met her selling candy. I was, I was making the delivery, and she was there. We spoke uh, we struck up a conversation. I'd been so busy in my early life that I'd never really considered marriage. But she was, and still is, an incredible individual. 
we were married not nearly as long as we should have because she had she was a, a sickly person. She passed unexpectedly. We were only married, I think, 18 years. I, I missed her greatly, her guidance. She gave me she gave me ideas that I would not have had otherwise. We were unfortunate in that we could not bear our own children. So Catherine wanted to do things for other people's children. There were many orphans in the area. People could not afford to keep their children in many instances. She had me start the industrial school. She was really the background to a lot of the ideas and charities that I would participate in. After she passed, it was, it was a terrible time for me. I realized that I wanted to dedicate my wealth to, to helping children and to helping others. And all of what I did really was, was, in, was following her visions. So she played a pretty big role in your business practice. Yes. She allowed me to, me, to fulfill many of the ideas that I had in the business world. But she, she was the guiding light for the charity, for helping others. I always knew that I wanted to use anything that I could make to help others. She supplied a lot of the ideas. Since we did not have children of our own, she was very emphatic that she wanted to help the poor children of others. She felt very strongly that if you gave a young individual, the opportunity to be educated, to learn a trade, to learn a work ethic, that they would, all, they would have a much greater chance to succeed, and she was correct. We led a lot of young people to productive and active lives. Yeah. <clears throat> One of our listeners would like to know, did your mother live to see you become a success? Yes, she did. She, she actually lived uh, to see me. She, she, she lived to see me fail many times, but she also did live to see me <clears throat> be successful in some of my ventures. Yeah. What was your vision for the community of Hershey? I always felt that if you had employees that were happy, that had good living conditions that they would work very hard for you. My business required that individuals work pretty hard. It also required that we had, that we needed quite a few workers, quality workers, by providing them with comforts that other companies would not provide. We brought many, many good people to work in our factory. We had good supervision. Our farmers supported us with raw materials. We did everything we could with the, the, for the town of Hershey. <clears throat> we put in a trolley system. Our employees did not have to worry about walking through the mud to get to work. We had stores where they could buy economically. I put in an amusement park where they could take their families. I did everything that I could think of to give my employees the opportunity to actually enjoy life and to work hard at the same time. A wonderful idea. What do you think about the town of Hershey today? I'm utterly amazed. I am totally blown away with what has happened to the town of Hershey. We started basically with vacant fields, built a factory, built homes that people would live in, put transportation systems in. Uh, we put had a good fire company, post office. I gave my employees the basics of everything that they needed to have a happy life. I promoted churches of different religions. 
I had Catholic churches, Church of the Brethren, Lutheran, Presbyterian. I felt that a strong religious foundation was instrumental for having happy families, and I did my best to support the churches. We literally did everything we could think of to make the town of Hershey a wonderful place. We had free public schools. We had libraries. We had a men's club with a swimming pool and many other uh, facilities. I built a stadium. We had baseball fields. We literally did everything that we could. We had a huge public swimming area. We had a ballroom where the most famous people in the entertainment community came to perform. We really, I tried to create more of a, an utopian lifestyle for my employees. I felt that if they had everything that they wanted for their families, that it would result in a, in a group of individuals who, that would want nothing more than for the company to, th to thrive and prosper because I made a point of the more that the company prospered, the more that the employees would prosper in their living conditions. That's a good way to think. Um, as we've talked before, but you're, you had a lot, did a lot of philanthropy that was focused on children. Would you like to expand on what brought that to you? Well, as I said, my wife, Catherine, and I couldn't have children of our own. So we wanted to help other people's children that were in need. Children are the foundation of the future. If you educate them, show them how to earn a good living, the world will prosper. If the children are ignored, the evolution of the world will pay the price. You are absolutely correct on that. One of your first philanthropic endeavors was founding the Hershey Industrial School in 1909. Would you please tell our listeners about that industrial school? I founded a school for orphan children. In those days, there was very little social net. Orphans were often forced to live with their families. They would not receive education. They would have to be basically child labor. So I started a school where orphan children were housed, fed, and educated free of cost. We taught them how to raise their foods. We taught them how to work on the farm. And we gave them a wonderful education. The industrial school today is a, a wonderful facility. There are currently over 2,000 children enrolled. The first year that we opened the industrial school, we had four children. So are you happy with the, the industrial school today, the way it's being run? I'm delighted. They've done away with a lot of the old structures. They've modernized all the facilities. It's now open to girls, so it's not just open to boys. So it is, it's truly a facility that lays strong educational foundations. They play sports. We have students that have graduated are currently in some of the finest colleges in our country. Yes, in spite of the fact that you only had the equivalent of a fourth-grade education, you really stressed the importance of a good education. Will you discuss the importance of education for everybody? I realized that if I had been better educated, I would have done better in my early business endeavors. I swore that if I ever had the opportunity, I would help the young. Without education, life can be a dead-end street. A quality education is the key to, a, to the future. I'm not just speaking in terms of courses that will lead you to college. We had an industrial school. We taught children carpentry. We taught them how to work with metals. We taught them how to do
do plumbing work. Education should be for everybody. Education can be simply learning how to do a job, or it can be learning how to travel to the stars. But education is truly the foundation for success. All right, let's take a small break here. Uh, We will be back in a little bit. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock for Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. Hi, this is Marla Brooks from Stirring and Cauldron. Thursdays are a great night on the Para-X Radio Network. We start off the evening with Journey into the Light, Chapter 3, with your hosts, Psychic Little T and Tabby Cat Gash at 7 p.m. Eastern. Then, on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 8 p.m., it's Tango and Friends, hosted by Bruce Tango. And on the alternate Thursdays at 8 p.m., tune in to Stirring the Cauldron, the Archive podcast. Every week at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me on Stirring the Cauldron Live. And then at 10 p.m., stick around for New Aeon Now with Lily Alley, Davron Michaels, and Christine Matza. Finally, to round out the night, join Dr. Kelly Renee Schutz on the Paranormal Encounters podcast. All this, every Thursday, right here on Para-X. Hello, everyone. Barry Strom here. For the past years, I've been using my gift of spirit communication to bring you the words of many historic and holy spirits. I recently finished my eighth book and possibly most important book, Message of God for a Modern World. The book contains 60 messages of God that I've personally channeled. It's a superb, non-denominational devotional that will bring you a new understanding of the afterlife and how to bring happiness following God's simple words. The soft cover and ebook are available on Amazon and personalized copies are available on my website, barrystrom.com. If you follow these messages, you will truly understand God's plan for all of us. Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Welcome back, everybody. Connie, let's have some more questions. Okay. One of our listeners would like to know, and I would also. Where did you get the idea for the famous Hershey Kiss? That was my wife Catherine's idea. Somehow or other, she decided that it would be a great idea if you could have a small piece of chocolate that would resemble how your lips puckered up when you gave a kiss. I know it sounds weird, but it turned out to be a huge success for us. It certainly is. I've put many of those down. Ah, in 1911, you had a ticket to be aboard the Titanic. What happened that you had to cancel? Well, by 1911, Catherine was having some health problems, so she wasn't feeling great. But I was working on on trying to get some supply agreements put together. <clears throat> I truly wanted to go on that ride because I had some good friends that were there. And we're going to be on the ship. But at the last minute, I just said that we I just couldn't do it. Now I realize that uh, that was God telling me that I had an awful lot more to accomplish in my life. Instead of dying in 1911, I wound up passing in 1945. But that was his will. He guided me. He blessed me. And I tried to make the most of his blessings. Yes, he had quite the to-do list for you. At the time, did you realize that God had much for you to accomplish, or did you figure that out later? I never really understood that. I always thought that it was something that I had something to accomplish. I thought that, well, I knew that I always wanted to help others. I knew from my childhood experiences of having to travel and not getting an education. I knew that that lack of education had helped me not succeed in some of my endeavors. I just simply always wanted to help others. 
What I didn't realize was that was a life plan that I'd truly been sent back with. I know that anybody listening to this show probably understands the concept of, of spirit guides and angels helping. Once things started to go right for me, it just seemed like I couldn't make any real mistakes. God was blessing me. He understood that I'd, he knew what was in my soul. He knew that my wife and I would do what we could to help others. Okay, your wife, Catherine, passed unexpectedly in 1915. How did that affect your life? It destroyed it for a while. I knew that she had been in poor health, but I never expected that she was going to pass. We had gotten married fairly late in life, and I truly loved her. From that day forward, whenever I would travel, I would take her picture with me. I never imagined being with another woman. It was, she's a spectacular soul, and I'm still with her over here. Okay. Uh, did you ever discuss philanthropy, philanthropy <laughs> with Andrew Carnegie? Yes, we would talk. Andrew told me that he would, was going to dedicate the rest of his life to helping others. He was a good person. Yes, he had done some business things that probably weren't totally above board, but he did truly use what he made to help others. I mean, he, his accomplishments were absolutely amazing. While I accomplished a lot, his philanthropy accomplished mega things. Yes, he's a good soul. What do you consider your greatest innovation? I learned how to mass produce. Keep in mind, in those days, the only equipment for making chocolate was European, and I actually used that for many years in the beginning. But as we learn more and more about the candy industry. I got ideas on how to mass produce some of these items. For instance, when we first made the Hershey Kiss, we had to hand wrap each item. We made innovations in how to design soil wrap, foil wrapping machines for the kisses. We made many innovations in how to mass produce tangible items such as our candies were. We did, we learned how to ship things. One of our greatest innova innovations was during World War II when we designed a candy bar that would not melt for the soldiers in the tropics. We did much. I relied heavily on many of the people that worked for me. I knew that I did not have the technical knowledge, but I would hire people that did, and I would listen to them. I treated them well, and they came up with some incredible innovations. And through God's guidance, I would make their ideas become realities. In 1918, you transferred much of your wealth including your stake in the Hershey Chocolate Company, to the Hershey Trust, which funds the Hershey School. Why did you decide to do that at that point? That was a couple of years after my wife died. I realized that I would have no heirs. I knew that I wanted to have a lasting effect on the children. I wanted my charities to continue. I knew that I did not require a great deal of wealth to be happy. My happiness was in, seeing, was in helping others. So I made a permanent transfer of, the, of my stake in the Hershey Chocolate Company and put it in trust. And those funds would be used in perpetuity to fund my charities, and especially the industrial school. 
Today, those funds are still being used. They helped make a down payment for the Hershey Medical Center. It's, it was one of the best things I ever did. But I think it was a result of the great grief from losing my wife and just simply realizing that I did not have a family to take care of. How did the depression of the 1930s affect your business? Candy was a luxury. So as many of the families were hurting, they simply did not, were not able to purchase luxuries. So candy sales diminished. I had many wonderful employees. And even though my sales were dropping, we had accumulated great wealth. I had plans for th- properties and buildings that I wanted to put up. So I employed my my people building the structures such as the wonderful hotel, the community club, many other structures. But I kept them working through the Depression. I had faith that there'd be a time that business would come back and our economy would return. And I wanted those employees to be there when that happened. Why did so you f- I made jobs for them. Yeah, why did you feel so strongly about your employees? I mean, that was a wonderful thing. I love I love my employees. I wanted them to prosper. I wanted them to do well and I wanted them to be happy. When you care when you truly care for individuals, you will do what you need to do for them. Yes. Did you feel that your employees responded to all that you did for them? Many of them absolutely did. There came a time that they wanted more than I was able to give them. But many of them were were absolutely wonderful individuals, and I still see many of them over here. In 1937, you had a sit-down strike at Hershey Chocolate Corporation, and the strikers were forcibly removed from the factory. Will you tell us about what happened? It was a time of great discontent in the country. We had just been going through this incredibly terrible depression. Families were not doing as well as they had before, obviously. I tried to make as much work as I could. There were also things that we probably could have done better in safety. It was, in some ways, a a dangerous manufacturing process. It was a time of unionization, and the unions were building discontent among some of our people. Some of them decided that if they would just simply sit down and not and stop working and force us to close the factory, that we would uh, succumb to their demands. I wasn't as active at that time because I was up in years, and management decided that they would make a stand, so they did remove the employees, and, and they were eliminated from the workforce. In 1939, you made your first agreement with the Bakery and Confectionery Workers Union. After all you did for the workers, why did they unionize? Times had changed. They had demands. They wanted things. We were at the end of the Depression. I had used a lot of my funds for keeping them, giving them jobs. So we couldn't meet many of the demands that they wanted. So they wound up unionizing. Tell us about how you supported World War II. We produced millions upon millions of candy bars for the troops. We designed candy bars for different areas. We did as much as we could. We made parts, machine parts for weapons. We totally mobilized behind the war effort. I was... I was in my 80s at this time, but my management team did an incredible job 
of supporting the war effort. Do you think sh they should have done any more for the war effort? Is there anything more they could have done? I really don't think there's that much more they could have done. They, they received many rewards from the government for their efforts. Yeah. How were you judged when you returned to heaven? When I returned to heaven, it was a glorious time for my soul. I was well judged. They told me that, yes, everybody makes mistakes, but that I had succeeded in helping so many people. So I was... I was very, very happy with how I was judged when I returned. Yeah. Would you please tell us what it's like when you passed? Well, I died of pneumonia, so I was uncomfortable as my time grew near. When, I, when my soul left my body, I saw this light. All of a sudden, I saw angels. I saw my beautiful wife. I saw my mother, my father, my guides and angels took me to this incredible place and they explained that I was home. Hmm. How important is charity in the eyes of God? Incredibly important. When you return and are judged, you will find that charity is one of the most important things that your guides speak of. So what would you tell those individuals that have great wealth today? I would tell them to follow my example and those of Andrew Carnegie and many of the other great philanthropists. Assure that your family is comfortable for the future and then use your excess funds to help others. You will not take it with you. I can assure you of that. In 1963, the Penn State University Milton S. Hershey Medical Center was funded with a $50 million award from the Milton Hershey School Trust Fund. What did you think as you watched from the other side? I was delighted. I could not have come up with a better way to help so many more individuals. Keep in mind that the Hershey Medical Center is a teaching hospital. We have taught thousands of doctors to go help others. Just think of what that means, that thousands of individuals are out there. Many are helping those that need help the most. Many are doing charity work. Many of the doctors are working in foreign countries as missionaries. One thing that they instill at the at, at any of my institutions are a firm foundation and belief in hard work and helping others. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, one listener would like to know what realm you're on in heaven. I am blessed to be on the, on the seventh realm. That does not surprise me. Um, do you approve of the current management of the trust fund? They are doing some things that I, that I would probably not be doing. But in general, they are doing an immense amount of good. I think that they are probably spending more than they should be on their expenses. I lived a very frugal life. But the trust fund is serving many, many people around the world. And it continues to operate in many of the beliefs and foundations that I established. Is there anything that you think you should have changed in how you ran your life? Possibly I should have tried to get some additional education. I was just simply trying to, to exist. I had to work. I did sometimes that I, I would not focus properly. Sometimes I would not accept failure as fast as I should have accepted it. I should have accepted the failures and the education I received from them and probably moved on more rapidly. Okay. Does the Hershey Corporation purchase cocoa f from sources that utilize child or slave labor? In my time, most of the cocoa was coming from the Caribbean. I, I tried to be as fair as I could 
in my in my purchasing. Today, cocoa beans are being grown in Africa, and Africa is an incredibly poor country. I know that there are suppliers that are taking advantage of child labor. I know that the country that the company for twenty years has been trying not to deal or utilize companies or suppliers with child or slave labor. Okay. It's very difficult to monitor these companies. I know that it is an announced policy, and I know that the company tries to follow through on it. But there are indeed situations where the labor force is being hidden from our purchasing agents. During the early 1900s, African cocoa population increased rapidly. Did you realize that much of the production was done with slave labor at that time? I didn't realize how much was. I realized that there was much brutality in Africa. I realized that it was incredibly poor, and I realized that they were trying to find industry that would create jobs. I did attempt to send missionaries and to do help in those countries. But yes, I was aware that we were purchasing items from individuals that utilized child and slave labor. But in all honesty, I wasn't really sure what I could do about it in those days. Yeah. What did you believe was your purpose in life? I always firmly believed that my purpose in life was to help others. I wanted to be able to have people work for me. I wanted the people that worked for me to be happy. I wanted them to have be able to educate their children. Because I was not educated, I realized the value of having a good education. So... I always felt this need to do charity and to help. It wasn't until I returned home that I realized that that was the life plan with which I'd come back. You supported churches of all faiths, even though you were raised Mennonite. What were your true religious beliefs? An absolute understanding that God existed. An absolute understanding that God wanted individuals to help others. An absolute understanding that the foundation of powerful, of, of successful evolution laid with the younger generation and just simply many of the basic faiths that were taught to us in the Mennonite church. I have a quick question one of our listeners would like to know if you've met up with Paul Newman, because Paul Newman led his life very much like you did as far as helping others. Yes, Paul is one of the ones that we speak to over here. <clears throat> he is a wonderful individual, and much of what he did is continuing to help others as well. Yeah. Okay, did you ever receive any messages from angels or Holy Spirits when you were on this side? I would have dreams. I would, have, I would see angels and spirits. I would pray for guidance. I would ask God what he wanted of me, and I would ask him how I should proceed to follow what, that I could succeed in what he wanted for me. So I think I was receiving more messages than I understood, but I was certainly receiving great guidance that led to the blessings that he bestowed upon me. Yeah. Okay, you tried to set up a similar school system in Cuba. Will you tell us about that operation? Cuba was a very backward country. I tried to educate their young. I actually bought properties down there, set up schools, set up transportation systems. <clears throat> but Cuba was very, very difficult, especially during times of violence down there. But Cuba is a, the, the Cuban people are wonderful people. I truly wish there was help available for them today. I'm with you on that. 
Mr. Hershey, it's been wonderful speaking with you this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Do you have a final message for us? Yes, I would like to thank you so much for allowing me to come through. I was very, very blessed by God. I was also very, very blessed to totally understand that humans need to help others. I was able to meet a wonderful woman. She supported me. She gave me some wonderful ideas. And her spirit, even after her passing, continued to guide me to help others. I would hope that anyone that's listening to this show would decide what they can do to bring aid and comfort to individuals that need it. The country is going through a very difficult time. You're far from being out of this inflation and recession period. There will be many, many people that need help. I hope that you would take time to be one of those people. So thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I truly appreciate it. I hope that I might be able to still influence people through my speech. I'm very proud of what the companies that I founded continue to do. People with great wealth should consider how they can do things that would continue, continue to help others even after their passing and for many, many years into the future. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay, next week, very, very special week, Christmas week. And we're going to celebrate it uh, next Sunday night. We are going to receive messages from three famous religious spirits. They will have holiday messages, Christmas messages for us. We're going to channel messages from Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, and the Reverend Billy Graham. This will be an outstanding show, and I guarantee that it will be a, a wonderful addition to your holiday. In two weeks, we are going to be on the air on Christmas night. And we will be having our annual Christmas show with Mary, Joseph, and a message from Jesus. So if that's not an incredible Christmas week for you, I don't know what else we can do. My new book, Messages of God for a Modern World, is currently available on Amazon. It's in soft cover. It's an e-book. It's available on Kindle for immediate download. Signed copies are available on my website. It's barrystrom.com. I can still get the books to you in time for Christmas if you want some really wonderful presents. These are This is a book of God's words. I put very little of my input into it. It's all his wonderful messages. All of our shows are on our YouTube channel. I think we're up to over 360 videos now. Tell your friends about it. Tell your friends about the wonderful messages that you can hear from us. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. I know I did. Trip down memory lane. Thanks for listening. Join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. And I would like to thank you all as well for joining us. I want you all to have a wonderful week. God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com.